Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. I can't think of a more important conversation to be having. War's too strange to be processed alone. Coming up, a conversation about the voices and language of war with Marine Corps veteran and author Phil Cly. His first book, Redeployment, won the National Book Award. That's Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. War, said a character in Margaret Atwood's novel, The Robber Bride, is what happens when language fails. If that's true, then what words do we use to talk about war when it happens? Over the centuries, many have tried to find those words. In doing so, they've produced some of our finest literature. With me today is one such writer. Phil Cly is a U.S. Marine Corps veteran who served as a public affairs officer in Iraq's Anbar province from January 2007 to February 2008. After returning to the United States, he pursued an MFA in creative writing from Hunter College, graduating in 2011. His first book, a collection of short stories called Redeployment, won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2014. Of the collection, the judges wrote, If all wars ultimately find their own Homer, this brutal, piercing, sometimes darkly funny collection stakes Cly's claim for consideration as the quintessential storyteller of America's Iraq conflict. The National Book Critics Circle also gave Mr. Cly its award for the best debut in any genre of writing. And you can also find his writing in many newspapers and journals, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Granta. Now, Phil Cly is in Boise to speak at an event sponsored by the Boise Public Library, Rediscovered Books, and the Friends of the Boise Public Library. And he joins me now. Welcome to Boise. Thank you so much. Great to be here. You're in uh, good company for the National Book Award, including Tony Dorr from Boise, Idaho. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> He's a great writer as well. As it must have been an amazing evening for you. It, it was, it was uh, astonishing. Very nice man, too, really. Uh, he is. Lives a, uh, one of the cool things about it is you get to, to meet all these great writers <laughs> who you normally think of as just sort of names on a book. And um, yeah, it was an incredible evening. Uh, well, I thought it was overwhelming. Yeah, uh, it it seems so for you, and it, it was kind of cute. You hadn't even written anything out until that that morning. I didn't think I was going to win, so it was my wife who made me write uh, write a speech. She was like, "You have to write a speech," <laughs> and I <laughs> I printed it out right before we got in the cab to go to the ceremony. <laughs> well, Idaho even gets a brief mention in one of your stories. We'll we'll get to that in a moment, so you, we get a little a little uh, taste in there. Take me back, uh, wow, gosh, a decade ago mm -hmm. when you were uh, graduating college and um, you decided to go into the military. Yeah. Why? Because we were at war. Um, you know, there's always a strong respect for public service in my family. Neither of my parents were in the military. Um, my dad was in the Peace Corps, um, which is pretty different from the Marine Corps. Um, my mother had worked in international development for years. Uh, my grandfather was a career foreign service officer. Um, so I think if, if in high school you'd asked me w what I was going to do, I probably would have said I was going to join the foreign service. But we were at war when I was in college. My older brother, one of my older brothers, had joined the Marine Corps. And actually one of my younger brothers ended up joining the Army. And so it seemed like that was the best way to you know, to, to, to put myself into a position where I'd have responsibility, where I'd hopefully be able to affect things for the better. A uh, lot of people would say, we're at war, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. So I'll volunteer army now, so, or right. military. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but something else was inside of you. To yeah, say. and it was, you know, it was an interesting time to be joining. I mean, I was commissioned in 2005, and that was the year that public opinion started turning against the war. And you, ha did you have an opinion as you went in? Yeah, I mean, y you know, I think there's a, there's a difference. Um, the, the, there's the public discussion about the war, and, and certainly at a place like, um, you know, I was at, at Dartmouth, and you know, I had one professor who was like, you, you're, doing, you're making a terrible decision. You need to come talk to me. And I was told that joining the military would be a death of the mind, um, which it was not. Describe your job. You were um, in public affairs. Yep. You were working with journalists like me, uh, yeah, absolutely. who would come over and uh, embed and uh, cover yeah. cover the war, and then also you were in charge of Marines who went out and also and documented 
right. what's going on, right? Yeah, so I had, I had a great group of Marines who kind of traveled all over Anbar province and, um, you know, went on operations, um, uh, wrote stories, took video, uh, took photographs. Uh, I was an advisor to the general, had a, you know, a variety of, of, of other subsidiary duties. It was an interesting time to be there. And also, you know, I was there in 2007 during the surge, during the Anbar awakening. So when we went into Anbar mm -hmm. province, Anbar province was incredibly violent. Um, you know, there's a suicide truck bomb outside our main gate. The first uh, month that we were there, um, the bomber had detonated and families going to mosque and Marines brought them in. And I, there were so many injured uh, that we were bringing in that the surgeons ran out of trauma tables and were actually doing surgery on the floor. Um, and by the end of the deployment, it was much, much, mm -hmm. I mean, just dramatically less violent. Um, I think it's September 2007, President Bush came to the province to kind of say, we're doing really well, and then there was a handover around the time that you left, right? There was, yeah, so it was, it was, um, it was a very, it was a critical time. Yeah, yeah, uh, in Turn, the war. turning point. And also a time of sort of increased public debate. Uh, there was, you know, Petraeus famously came back in, in late 2007, uh, along with Brian Crocker. So it was, it, and, you know, a lot of the discussion revolved around the surge and the Ambar awakening and what precisely had happened and whether or not it was yeah. sustainable. You've been very open, very transparent um, in interviews and your writing in the New York Times about the fact that you had, you didn't see combat, yeah. per se, and you, you didn't have a job that put you in harm's way a lot. And that you felt a little, I don't know, guilty about that sometimes. Yeah, sure. But uh, that you were still determined to write. You know, a lot of a lot of books coming out of the Vietnam War and other wars have been writ written by combat veterans. Yeah. But nevertheless, you wanted to tell these stories. Yeah, and the stories are not all about, um, you know, combat troops. Exactly. Uh, uh, Many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the stories reflect this sense of, oh, I have a, a desk job. Right. I, don't, I feel guilty about it. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, give a sort of broad perspective. You know, there's th there are stories told from, you know, an infantryman, a, um, a uh, artilleryman, you know, tells one of the stories. But there's also stories from a mortuary affairs specialist, from a chaplain, mm -hmm. from uh, an adjutant. My favorites. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's it's the military is is a huge organization there's a lot of different a lot of different parts um, you know that make up what what the military does uh, and I wanted to get a sense of that and and you know all those different roles and, and the way that they um, come together was really interesting to me and really important you know you have radically different deployment depending on you know what you did and also where you were what time you were there I have two friends I have two friends named Matt they're both um, scouts in the cavalry and they were both in the exact same section of Iraq. They both uh, worked with the same Iraqi translator, uh, a guy who loved uh, American rap music and was nicknamed Suge Knight. Um, but one of the mats was there in 2006, one was there in 2008, and their stories are totally different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that's true for them, you know, what does it mean for, you know, a chaplain in Ramadi? What does it mean for, you know, a, a military policeman or somebody doing you know, engineer um, route clearance missions. And to get all those different voices in, is that why you wanted to choose the, the modality of the short story? That's one of the reasons, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, to be able to jump into these radically different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there's no one veteran story there's no, you know, you don't like go to war and then come back and know the truth of what the Iraq war was, right? It's just this huge complicated thing and everybody's experience is so particular. So I wanted 12 narrators who would kind of um, sometimes talk about the same topics but in very different ways, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the experience of, of killing, for example, as experienced by, you know, the infantryman who tells the first story is very different from, you know, a psychological operations mm -hmm. specialist relationship to it. It's very different from the artilleryman who's, you know, on a crew that fires a round and he never sees what that does. Um, and so, you know, I wanted those, you know, sort of similar themes to be worked at from very different angles. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, let's uh, give our viewers and listeners a taste of that and have you read from the very beginning the title sure. story, Redeployment, which is what started all of this all right. when it was published. Just start from the beginning. We shot dogs. Not by accident. We did it on purpose, and we called it Operation Scooby. I'm a dog person, so I thought about that a lot. First time was instinct. I hear O'Leary go, Jesus, and there's a skinny brown dog lapping up blood the same way he'd lap up water from a bowl. It wasn't American blood, but still, there's that dog lapping it up. And that's the last straw, I guess, and then it's open season on dogs. At the time, you don't think about it. You're thinking about who's in that house, what's he armed with, how he's going to kill you, your buddies. You're going block by block, fighting with rifles good to 550 meters, and you're killing people at five in a concrete box. So right off, right off the bat, right off the top, people will understand that this book is going to go right into the hard stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, we, we have a lot of mythology about war, and I think sometimes uh, glorify it in our storytelling, mm -hmm. but it's ultimately about killing. Well, yeah, um, and you know, I'd, I'd known a couple guys who were in the Second Battle of Fallujah and had the experience of killing dogs because they'd seen them eating corpses. Um, and you know, that's the first story that I wrote. Um, for, some way, for some reason that seemed to get at something um, Almost like the, 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 the strangeness mm -hmm. of, of some of the, you know, the morality of what you do during war and the things that make, make sense, actually, right? In, in some way, it's an act of, of, of respect uh, to do that. Um, and as the story goes on, and I won't give it away, yeah. the, the title character does come home and right. does encounter another dog and uh, it becomes an issue of respect as well right with what he with what he does yeah and that so. story is very much about it's you know it's set as he's coming home right when he comes mm -hmm. home and trying to shift from the mind state that he's in and that makes sense when he's overseas to you know a, a, a way of being that makes more sense for going to the mall with his wife um, living at home so many of the stories seem to be about that, about um, trying to come to terms, coming home, for instance, yeah. trying to have that conversation with people about what you did, what you didn't do, because some people want to know, did you kill anybody? You know, right. it's, it's just having those conversations about your experience. And I wondered if you could read another one about a young man in college who's talking to a mm -hmm. woman and trying to sure. get that feeling across. This is a psychological operations specialist telling the story. It's the one soldier narrator. I looked down at my hands, then back up at Zara. I didn't know how to tell her what coming home meant. The weird thing with being a veteran, at least for me, is that you do feel better than most people. You risk your life for something bigger than yourself. How many people can say that? You chose to serve. Maybe you didn't understand American foreign policy or why we were at war. Maybe you never will. But it doesn't matter. You held up your hand and said, I'm willing to die for these worthless civilians. At the same time, though, you feel somehow less. What happened, what I was a part of, Maybe it was the right thing. We were fighting very bad people, but it was an ugly thing. And now with ISIS moving into the very areas where, um, where you were, other areas where people fought, I know from talking to at least one counselor that works with combat veterans, it's bringing up these feelings again mm -hmm. of, was it worth it? Right. I think um, there's, there's that question, was it worth it? What, what was I a part of? How do I reconcile my sense of my own service with the, the kind of changing American perspective on war, right? So, and it's very easy, I think it's much easier for civilians to, to divorce themselves from um, 
you know, the, the decisions that we all make as a country. Uh, there was a poll out recently. 51% um, of Americans say that they opposed the Iraq War when it started, um, which is kind of uh, darkly amusing because the Iraq War had, I think, 70s approval rating in the 70s when it happened. Um, so, uh, you know, after the fact, if you didn't serve, it's much easier to pretend um, that it didn't have anything to do with you or, you know, blame it on whichever particular politician you like, uh, whether, you know, decisions made by Obama in 2000, in the early, uh, in his first term or, you know, decisions made by Bush. But I think for veterans it's often really visceral. Um, we have a, a, a connection to that place. It matters to a lot of us what's happening there. Um, and we really wanted it to succeed. Um, and so as the situation develops, I think it, it just constantly um, causes a lot of us to, to look back and, and, and think about not only you know, what we did, but also what we as a country are responsible for and what our relationship is as, as citizens to our own mil military policy. I know that you know, serving changed my, in a very fundamental way, my, my relationship to what my job is at a, as a citizen. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not up to the 18-year-old who signs um, you know, on the contract to, to ensure that two years later when he gets sent to a war zone that we're going to have well-thought-out war policy, right? It's not on him alone. That's, that's something that for all Americans. Um, Speaking of President Obama, um, he read and recommended your book. At yeah. the time, at least one headline says, Obama recommends anti-Iraq war book. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. It's not an, I don't think of it an, as an anti-war book, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of dark things in the book. It's about war. It's about love, too. Yeah. Um, it's a lot about love. Of course, of course. You know, I, I've, um, I have a friend, Elliot Ackerman, and um, Elliot is an uh, infantry officer, served five deployments, um, and he was in the CIA. He's a Silver Star recipient, um, and he wrote a book called Green on Blue, which is a very interesting novel uh, about Afghanistan told from an Afghan perspective. Um, and he was talking about, you know, courage, right, and some of the things that he saw. He was in the Second Battle of Fallujah you know, guys risking their life for other people. And he said, you know, he's thinking about, you know, what the opposite of, of fear is, right? It's not courage. Courage is an emotion. You never feel brave. He said, it's love. Guys do that because they love each other. So you don't perceive the book as an anti-war book, clearly. I don't, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a it's book it's about it's the experiences. The experience right? of war. If, if, you're, if you are anti-war, You'll read You'll sh <laughs> you, should f you should be able to find the things mm -hmm. about war that you don't like because I'm trying to be honest. But if you feel differently, you'll find, hopefully, you'll find other aspects of the experience honestly articulated because, you know, reality is not particularly didactic. And start that conversation. And right. I know that's what you're yeah. hoping to do. When you, when you got the award, you said, I can't think of a more important conversation to be having. Right. War is too strange to be processed alone. Yeah. So sounds like part of the impetus for writing the book or at least carrying it out into the world is so that people will have those conversations yeah about and, 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 and think about and what civilians we civilians too mm -hmm. yeah. yeah think about what what happened what the experience was like um, and and <laughs> why is it so important to be having that conversation I know that right now for a lot of people the war is kind of or the wars I should say in Afghanistan Iraq kind of in a package and put aside for a lot of people that moved on. Yeah, except we're still involved in both countries. Yeah. It, it doesn't stop, right? Um, we, we, we still are a nation that uses military force all the time. Um, and, you know, it's, as, you know, as I said before, it's our job as citizens to hold our elected leaders accountable. I, our, is our military policy on autopilot or is it, is it, um, or is it something that has clear achievable aims? The other thing is um, not just having better stories about war so we have a better understanding of what we're responsible for as a country and what we can do, but also having better stories about war so that we have a better understanding of 
of the new veterans in our communities. We're in the middle of the largest reintegration of veterans into civilian life since Vietnam. And, you know, if you're a member of the all-volunteer military, it's a very strange thing. I live, you know, I live in the Northeast, which is, I think, a little different from Idaho. Fewer people. Yeah, probably. every once in a while I'm told Served. that I am the only Iraq or Afghanistan veteran that yeah. somebody's met, um, which is mind-boggling to me after so many years mm -hmm. of war. So how to start those conversations, though? Because it's not always comfortable for right. people. Sometimes they'll just say, well, geez, thank you for your service, or maybe I couldn't possibly understand what you went through. And I know those are both phrases that get overused. So how's, what's the best way, if you want to have that conversation with a veteran, to open it up, to start I mean, it? I think that the Tell thing is every, you, every yeah. veteran's going to be different. You mm -hmm. know, you, I think to come with no assumptions right. is the biggest thing. I. I you know, I met a, um, <laughs> early on, when I first joined, people tended to, to come up to me with this assumption that I must be some sort of incredible badass, right? Like, oh, man, you ever shoot those big guns or whatever. And then at a certain point, as I think as, you know, public opinion really started to turn even more against the war, and there's more stuff about PTSD, people would kind of assume that I was damaged or mm -hmm. something like that um, because I was a veteran. You know, I was talking to, to one, one veteran who, who ha actually did have PTSD, and he said, you know, people only want to hear about the worst stuff that ever happened to me. They never want to hear about the guys in my unit I loved, or the good times we had, or even, hell, what the biggest barracks rat I ever saw was. You know, it wasn't all bad. And I think just a veteran is, is you know, their experience is going to be very particular, and they're a whole person. They're not, they're not just a you know, instantiation of whatever particular meme is running out there mm -hmm. in, in the world about, about veterans and war. And so a certain kind of openness to that is, is probably the most important thing. I, I appreciate thank you for your service. I know some mm -hmm. veterans feel touchy about mm -hmm. it. Well, um, I'm, I, we're rapidly running out of time, but I mentioned at the beginning, Idaho gets a little cameo s word. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great story. We unfortunately don't have time to talk about it, but money as a weapon system right. is one of your stories. And you talk about a woman, oh, she could be from Idaho, she could be from Kansas, <laughs> who is head of a woman's initiative in, and, you know, well, trying that, her that best. That guy's a sort of snarky, kind of, but, you know, that East Coast, like, oh, they're all the same <laughs> attitude. And he dismisses her, but she actually turns out to be pretty good. She actually turns out to have a lot yeah. of moxie. Yes. Probably because she's from Idaho, not <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, she's, it, it, but it's about this whole other part of the war, which mm -hmm. is the civilian component, people coming in, trying right. to help, trying to do their best. But the irony of it, you right. know, and there is a lot of irony and humor in your stories as well, I want to point out, and, and just, you know, like bringing baseball uniforms in, because we're going to have the Iraqis play our national pastime. I think that's a great story. Another one that you uh, already mentioned is about a chaplain. Right. And it's really one of my favorite ones. It's called Prayer in the Furnace. Right. And I wonder um, if you could read, this is a journal entry. This is a chaplain who's really struggling with the things that he has seen and heard from the people he counsels. Yeah. And he's tried to report it, and he hasn't gotten anywhere with his higher ups, and he's yeah. just confounded. It's, it's a unit that has very bad leadership that's uh, important for understanding the story and very overly aggressive in a very, very violent place. And um, so he writes, I'd at least thought there would be nobility in war. I know it exists. There's so many stories and some of them have to be true. But I see mostly normal men trying to do good, beaten down by horror, by their inability to quell their own rages, by their masculine posturing and their so-called hardness their desire to be tougher and therefore crueler than their circumstance. And yet, I have this sense that this place is holier than back home. Gluttonous, fat, oversexed, overconsuming, materialist home, where we're too lazy to see our own faults. At least here, Rodriguez has the decency to worry about hell. How did you research these voices? Because I know even just from <sighs> reading you have a uh, an Amherst course in there, and I looked it up, <laughs> and it's a real course. Yeah. So you, you've done, you did a lot of research that went into these I characters. wonder if that professor knows that I nabbed his I wondered course about title. that, too, when I looked it up. Um, um, but did you talk to a lot of people, including I talked to a lot of people. Um, yeah, and I knew chaplains, and, and uh, there's a, a great documentary out there. Um, 
uh, about ch uh, military chaplains. Um, oh, son of a gun, the name's escaping me. Um, but um, yeah, every book had, every story had, there, so there was kind of technical research. So for the foreign service officer, a lot of that was reading Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction Reports. There's a, a memoir by a foreign service officer called um, We Meant Well, mm -hmm. uh, who did a job uh, very similar to, to what that narrator does. Uh, I talked to, to uh, foreign service officers and, and civil affairs soldiers, so a lot of that yeah. kind of research. And then there's also like, for the chaplain, I read a, a novel by Georges Bernanos called um, uh, Drive a Young Country Priest, uh, which is a beautiful novel. Has nothing really to do with war, um, but all everything to do with the kind of emotional and, and spiritual challenges that, that that chaplain is going through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of research went into each story. Well, it had to be genuine because you knew that people were going to be reading it who knew, right. knew exactly <laughs> what the yeah, situation was like. Absolutely. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. If people know you, can they f maybe find themselves in this <laughs> book? <laughs> yeah, I tried very hard not to make any, there are little, little things that you steal from your life. I didn't want uh, any one character to be like obviously a, a thinly veiled autobiographical fiction though. As a joke, I did put in, I had one <laughs> friend, um, when a character does his job, so I threw in like his apartment and, and like a, one thing that he said. And well, did you kill somebody off too? Did yeah, you know? I did that. <laughs> Um, but his girlfriend's mother texted him when she read the book, and she was like, are you the basis for this character? <laughs> and the character's not entirely savory. And I was like, no, tell her no. <laughs> it was a joke. Well, turnabout's fair play. You get killed <laughs> off in a book that's yeah. coming, off, <laughs> yeah, yeah. coming up as well, right? Yeah, and I do. Yeah, Ward the, S Ward the Encyclopedist by uh, Gavin Covite and Chris Robinson, Christopher Robinson, which is uh, it's a wild, really interesting book. Well, you're moving on. You're, you're writing a novel now, as I understand. Yes, I am. I won't cry because I know better <laughs> better than to do that but um, will it be set in in I don't think it'll be war? set in Iraq okay. no. yeah. in wartime or so we'll yeah. see we'll see we'll what see. we'll see what it, yeah, it turns into yeah I know it's a, a big process and this yeah. book took four years so yeah you've got some time to just eight so to speak yeah. <laughs> well thanks thanks Thank very you. much for taking the time to talk about this and I wish we had more time maybe we could stay a little bit and talk about how you wrote the book as a special extra for our viewers all right that'd be great thanks. thank you that's all the time we have unfortunately you've been listening to US Marine Corps veteran Phil Cly the author of redeployment which won the National Book Award for fiction in 2014 to learn more about mr. Cly's work or to watch this interview again check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.